Part 8, Chapter 5, Tommy <clears throat> An adventure entered into with a sense of civic duty and professional obligation ends in the bitter taste of abandonment, disloyalty, and salted airline peanuts. Just before the Girls, Girls, Girls tour, Heather and I caused the downfall of one of the country's biggest fucking coke dealers, and it was all because we didn't want to go to Jamaica alone. Our manager, Doc McGee, had a lot of suspicious friends who lived in the Caymans. They were these crazy macked out guys with only first names, Jerry, Lee, Tony, and they'd bring huge fucking suitcases full of coke and cash to the island where they'd launder their money without the IRS getting up into their shit. Lee, a tan, suave, filthy rich southerner, was one of the coolest of Doc's friends. I had originally met with him, with Vince, when we were chilling in the Caymans. Lee walked into Doc's rental house with an attache case, and the first words we spoke to him were, gimme, gimme, gimme. Because we knew what was in that fucking attache case, mountains of white powder to stuff up our noses. Lee opened the case and gave us a little rock. That's all you're gonna give us? Vince asked and yelled. I'll tell you what, Lee said, if you can open the case, you can have more. And with that, he gave us a knowing wink, shut the case, dropped a lock clasp, and spun the combination dial so we couldn't open it. We had that entire rock in our system in 10 minutes, and then, as always happens when you're high on coke, we started fiending hardcore for more. Vince and I grabbed the suitcase and tried every single combination. We were so coked out that we actually thought we were coming up with every single permutation of three numbers. Wait, Vince would yell in a flash of inspiration. Have we tried 666 yet? Finally, I went into the kitchen, grabbed a butcher knife, and cut the top off Lee's thousand dollar leather briefcase. Glittering inside like white gold were fucking dozens of huge plastic bags filled with coke. We slit them open and just dove in like we were bobbing for apples. After an hour of white heaven, Doc walked in. What the fuck are you doing? Vince looked up at him, his face white with coke and slobber. Well, Lee said we could have it if we opened it, and we opened it. Doc was fucking pissed and kicked us out of the apartment. I think we ended up paying for all the drugs we destroyed out of our royalties. Not long after that, Lee got busted. He used to have super hot chicks fly in to meet him in the Caymans for a few days. Always different girls coming, two at a time. And we just thought that he was a Mac fucking daddy. But the truth is that he was using them as mules to bring drugs into the US. One time, these killer blondes came down from New York, or I'm sorry, New Orleans, and killed, I'm sorry, kicked it with Doc, Lee, and the guys from Bon Jovi, who Doc was also managing. When it came time for the girls to leave, Lee taped drugs all over their bodies and dropped them off at the airport. It was their first time smuggling, so one of them had the bright idea of duct taping scissors to her body. That way, if she was in danger of being caught, she could just cut the drugs loose. Well, Einstein and her friend went through the metal detector and, of course, the scissors set it off. They searched her, found the coke, then searched her friend. It's a small island, and they knew the girls were with Lee and the Bon Jovi guys who had left the island on the previous flight. So they made the plane Bon Jovi was on turn around so they could search everyone's luggage for drugs. Then they sent cops looking for Lee, who had jumped on his jet and went into hiding on another island before they could catch him. And that's when Heather and I came in. We wanted to go to Jamaica. But we didn't know anybody there, and Lee, of course, was connected to fucking everyone in the Caribbean. So we had Doc get in touch with him, and he said he'd meet us in Jamaica to show us around. Unbeknownst to him, however, the feds had made a deal with the Jamaican government, and the second his plane touched down in Kingston, they surrounded it, pulled him off, put him on a jet for Tampa, and arrested him there. Heather and I felt terrible. We had no one to show us around Jamaica. Shit turned out cool for Lee, though. He got sentenced to life in prison. Sent us a couple letters, and then we didn't hear from him. Next thing I knew, when we were in Tampa on the Decade of Decadence tour, Lee was at the show, decked out in fucking Armani. 
He wouldn't tell me how he weaseled out of a life sentence in less than 10 years, but he did claim that he was keeping his nose clean. By then, I was keeping my nose clean, too. So was our manager, Doc McGee. Before he met us, he was living a secret life that blew up on him when he got busted for helping smuggle 40,000 fucking pounds of pot from Columbia into North Carolina. It wasn't his only bust, because he was also being accused of associating with some well-connected madmen who had conspired to bring over half a million pounds of blow and weed into the U.S. in the early 80s. So just as we were going through rehab, the law slapped Doc with a $15,000 fine and a five-year suspended prison sentence and made him set up an anti-drug organization, the Make a Difference Foundation, after he pled guilty in the North Carolina case. Doc knew that anybody else probably would have been in jail for at least 10 years for that shit, so he had to do something high profile to show the court he was doing the world some good as a free man. And his brainstorm was to commemorate the 20th anniversary of Woodstock with the Moscow Music Peace Festival, a giant spectacle of sobriety and international love that included us, Ozzy, the Scorpions, and Bon Jovi. All the money was supposed to go to anti-drug and anti-alcohol charities, including the Make a Difference Foundation. But it was all bad from the moment we stepped on the plane. We had a pact as a band that we were going to stay sober, and as a sober band, we were going to take our music to the fucking top. Dr. Feelgood was coming out in a couple weeks, and Doc told us that as a warm-up show in Moscow, it would be a great way to kick it off. He explained that everyone would be equal on the bill, there would be no headliners, and everyone would play a stripped-down, 50-minute show with no props or special effects. The running order would be the Scorpions, Ozzy, Us, and then Bon Jovi. But as soon as we stepped on Doc's plane, which was covered with stupid psychedelic hippie paintings by Peter Max, memories of the theater and girls tours flooded back. We were looking at a day-long plane ride with absolutely nothing to do. Then there was a so-called doctor on board who was plying the bands who weren't sober with whatever medicine they needed. It was clear that this was going to be a monumental festival of hypocrisy. Even Mick was in a shitty mood the whole flight. He had been helping pay for all our drug problems for a year, and now here he was flying to Moscow to help pay his management, the guys who were supposed to be taking care of us, for their drug problems. When we arrived at the gig, it started to become clear that this was a total clusterfuck and Doc had told each band something different in order to get them to do the show. John Bon Jovi thought it was just another stop on his world headlining tour, while we thought it was supposed to be a small-scale, reduced set. Then the production manager broke the news to us that we'd been demoted. We were on before Ozzy and the Scorpions. I was fucking livid. Doc was supposed to be our manager, looking out for our best interests, and he was favoring one of his newer clients, Bon Jovi, over us and the Scorpions, who in Russia were massive. Fuck you, Doc, Nikki said to him. We didn't fly all the way to Russia to be an opening act while Bon fucking Jovi gets to headline for an hour and a half. What's up with that? Dude, we are fucking going home, I screamed at Doc. I was pissed. This show isn't even about us. It's about Bon Jovi. You guys can't do that, Doc pleaded. That's fucked up. Hey, Nikki said, we're not doing anything wrong. You told us something that wasn't true. You said that everyone was supposed to be equal on this show, and now every band is getting more time than us. This is turning into a fucking joke. Finally, Doc appeased us, and more out of respect for Ozzy, who took us on tour with him when no one knew shit about us and was now playing with our friend Randy Castillo on drums, we said we'd do it. We played a decent show the first night, and it felt good to be busting out Dr. Feelgood and Same Old Situation live for the first time. Ozzy was fucking crazy and great as usual, and the Russians went ballistic for the Scorpions. The audience, which was about 125,000 people, started to stream out of the theater after the Scorpions. But then old John made his grand entrance right through the middle of the audience as lines of Russian police officers split the crowd in front of him like the Red Sea. As soon as he reached the front, the whole stage went boom. Fireworks and flash pots and pyrotechnics exploded into the air. The crowd went apeshit while I fucking shit in my pants. 
you need to get permits to get those kind of pyrotechnics into Russia, and it was clear that Doc knew all along what Bon Jovi was planning for its show. So as soon as those bombs went off, everyone in the crew and other bands looked at us. They knew that someone was about to get hurt. I hunted Doc down and found him backstage. I walked right up to him and pushed him in his fat little chest, knocking him over onto the ground like a broken weevil. As he lay there, Nikki broke the news. Doc, you lied to us again. This time you're fucking fired. We did the honorable thing and played the next day. Then had our tour manager book us a flight home on Air France. We didn't want to have anything more to do with helping Doc pay his legal bills. We flew back via Paris and New York and talked with Doug Thaler about ditching Doc and helping him start his own company to take care of us. The whole ride home, we felt like suckers for even going to Russia, but also felt like dumb fucks for dumping our management on the eve of releasing the first record we ever really felt pumped about. I hold myself up with Heather, just depressed and fighting the urge every day to make a big to-go order from the liquor store. I did interviews, I listened to the radio a little, and I could feel maybe a little momentum gr growing, but I had no idea. Then on October 3rd, my 27th birthday, I received a fax. It was from Nikki. If you could have just one thing on your birthday, some way for the world to say that it would all be okay, then I would wish for you with all my heart a number one album on the Billboard chart. Happy birthday, Tommy. You have a number one album. I drove to the newsstand, bought Billboard magazine, and had the album chart shellacked and mounted. Then I called everyone I knew. Chapter 6, Doc McGee. A manager bids a bittersweet adieu to his incorrigible charges. It was a dark time in my life, and I was trying to do something about it. I was trying to do something for everybody, for the world, for the bands, and for myself. The Moscow Music Peace Festival wasn't like promoting a festival in Poughkeepsie or Woodstock. This was something completely new, and nobody got it. For the bands, it was all about them, and who got what time slot, and who got the biggest dressing room, and how come someone got to shoot a firework off. By the time the show started, I was tired of hearing all the bitches bitch. Since Nikki's overdose, I knew that Motley and I had to split for one simple reason. I didn't like them. There was nothing I liked about them. I had to start dealing with my life and the bands in my life that were willing to let me help them. Motley never let me help. Instead, we just beat the shit out of each other. It had taken me a decade to get to that point with Motley Crue. From the moment I first saw them at the Santa Monica Civic Center and rode home in a merchandise truck that was completely empty because the guys had sold every single item, I knew they were beginning a career that could only go up. But I had no idea that as human beings they were in such complete downward spiral. I've managed Mink DeVille, James Brown, The Scorpions, Skid Row, Bon Jovi, and Kiss. I've been dragged through the deepest shit by all kinds of mentally ill people. But I have never been through what Motley Crue put me through. One day Mick would try to jump out a window. Why'd you do that? I would ask. I don't know. The next day Nikki would punch some guy in a suit off a bar stool. Why'd you do that? I don't know. The next day Tommy, the happiest kid in the second grade, would knock me on my ass. Why'd you do that? I don't know. Every day was like that. It was a constant. We were thrown out of hotels in every city. That's the difference between chicken shit and chicken salad. They weren't like Poison, who raised hell because they thought that was what rock stars should be doing. Motley Crue did stupid things because they were Motley Crue. There was no reason for anything. Just a Motley reason. They didn't even have to try. Their life was the rock and roll life. That band was poised to be the Zeppelin of its era but they could never get it together. Even today, I still believe that they could come out roaring again with something that's new and meaningful and true to where they are at in their lives. But if they do accomplish that, it's not going to be with me. I've already spent 10 years of my life apologizing for that band. As their manager, that's all I really did. Apologize. For years afterward, I'd walk into a hotel lobby and the receptionist would call to me, Mr. McGee? and I'd run up and drop to my knees and say, Oh, Jesus, I'm really sorry. They'd look at me funny and say, No, nothing's wrong. You have a telephone call. 
and I breathe a sigh of relief and thank the good Lord above that I wasn't managing Motley Crue anymore. Chapter 7, Vince Of a most unchivalrous duel with Axel Rose, a flower by any other name. Charisse was your average mud wrestler, blonde hair, big tits, and a killer hard body. When the girls from the Tropicana came back to my house to wrestle for my friends, she was always the most vicious fighter. She won every time and looked good doing it. She was just my type. When we started going out, she stopped dancing. Instead, she developed a $20,000 a month purse habit. And instead of wrestling other chicks, she fought with me all the time. Sobriety may have been easy for the other guys, but I was being driven to drink every night. Before the Feel Good album came out, I called up some of my buddies and went white water, white water rafting down Snake River in Idaho for 10 days. It was the best way I could think of to stay sober. Away from Charisse, the telephone, the band, the bars. It was just sunshine, rapids, and exercise. As soon as we returned to civilization, I called Charisse and she was in tears. I was at the cat house, she said, and Izzy was hitting on me. Izzy Stradlin? Yeah, he was all fucked up and I told him to get his hands off me because I was your wife. Then he grabbed my shirt and pulled it down. That fucking asshole. But that's not even the bad part. I slapped him across the face, of course, and then he karate kicked me as hard as he could in the stomach. He knocked the wind out of me. It really hurt, and everyone saw it. That little shit. The next time I see his motherfucking ass, I'm gonna fucking kill him. Oh yeah, I almost forgot, she added. Your album's number one. I don't think anyone had disrespected me like that since the bikers outside the whiskey hit on Beth and Lita so many years ago. But Izzy wasn't a biker. He was the guitarist in Guns N' Roses. I had taken that fucking band on tour as an opening act for a few of the girls' shows when nobody believed in them. They were nice then. Axel was a shy, humble guy who was a lot of fun to be with. But now they were starting to believe their own press clippings, and this guy who was supposed to be my friend was disrespecting my wife. Did you hear me? Your record's number one. Izzy had picked the wrong time to fuck with me because MTV Video Music Awards were just weeks away at the Universal Amphitheater. At the show, I left the band waiting in their limos outside and hung around backstage while Guns N' Roses played with Tom Petty. When Izzy walked off stage, looking like a cross between Eric Stoltz and Mask and Neil Young, I was waiting for him. You fucking hit my wife? So fucking what? He spat. All my blood rushed into my fist and I decked him. I decked him good right in the face. He fell to the ground like a tipped cow. Fred Saunders pinned my arms. The next time you fucking touch her, I'll fucking kill you. I yelled at Izzy's prone body as Fred dragged me away. I shook myself loose and we walked toward the door to make our escape. Before we reached the exit, Axel came snarling after us like an overdressed Doberman. Come on, motherfucker, I'm gonna fucking kill you, he yelled at our backs. I twirled around. His face was sweaty and twisted. Let's fucking go, I said to him, and I meant it. The blood was still pumping into my fists. He looked at me and squeaked like a little bitch. Just don't fuck with my band again, okay? And he walked away. Then Axel suddenly launched a press campaign about me. If I was on record, he would have sold millions of copies of me. Every article I read, every time I turned on the TV, he was claiming that I had sucker punched Izzy and been insulting Guns N' Roses for years, and he pledged to put me in my place, which was six feet under the earth. It was like rock and roll had suddenly turned into the World Wrestling Federation. It was such a betrayal. I had every right to knock Izzy on his ass, and it was none of Axel's business. On the girls' tour, Axel would come to me when his throat hurt, and I'd show him the tricks I'd developed for singing after a night spent destroying my vocal cords. Now he was sending little messengers to me with instrument instructions to meet him in the parking lot of Tower Records on Sunset or on the boardwalk of Venice Beach. Even though it was such a high school way of settling our differences, I showed up every time because the only thing that would have given me more pleasure than a number one album on the pop charts was breaking Axl Rose's nose. But Axl never showed. 
It finally got to the point that whenever he arranged a fight somewhere, I just sent some people to the spot to call me if and when he appeared. Maybe someone else would have just let it drop after Axel chickened out a good half dozen times, but I was pissed. He was in the press acting like he was king of the world, saying that I couldn't fight and that he was a red belt in this and that. But in real life, he was too chicken shit to back up his own word. So I finally went on MTV with a message for him. I said that if Axel wanted to fight me, then he should do it in front of the whole world. I proposed Monday night, fight night, at the forum. We'd go three rounds, and then the world would see who the pussy was. I was ready to go. I didn't even care about Izzy anymore. I dealt with him. He even called and apologized for what he did to Sharice. As for Slash and Duff McKagan, we were friends through it all. They knew what an asshole Axel was. I wanted to beat the shit out of that little punk and shut him up for good. But I never heard from him. Not that day, not that month, not that year, not that century. But the offer still stands. Chapter 8, Tommy. Like brave Ulysses sailing homeward from battle, our heroes find that powers on high have conspired to keep them lost at sea. We didn't hang out, we didn't party, we didn't stick our dicks where they didn't belong. We just flew into a city, played our asses off, and got the fuck out of there. For the first time, we were operating like a machine instead of four untamed animals. But then we started getting treated like a machine. The tour started off as this beautiful dream. We had our first number one album, which was so insanely popular that every damn song but one ended up on a single. We were on the cover of every magazine, and we had a big-ass stage show that filled dozens of trucks and went beyond anything we could have imagined when we were sitting in the Motley house, setting Nikki on fire. There were 36 Marshall stacks, 36 SVT stacks, and a kick-ass flying drum set, which I'd been fantasizing about all my life. The crowds were fanatical. They knew every lyric, every chord, every downbeat off every album. And for the first time, we were sober enough to appreciate it, and married enough. We all had new wives or fiancés to whom we wanted to stay faithful. I was with Heather, Mick was engaged to Emmy, Vince had Charisse, and Nikki had proposed to Brandy, though he probably wasn't looking forward to Thanksgiving at her mother's house. Motley Crew was now four dudes in the best physical shape they'd been in since they were born. But then fall faded into winter, winter turned to spring, and spring bloomed to summer, and we were still on the road, with no sign of stopping. Electra was still releasing singles from the album, and Doug Thaler, who was managing us by himself, had booked into tour had us booked into tours and festivals for another year solid. After a while, it didn't matter how much bank we were making, or how many weeks our album had been in the top 40, we just couldn't bring ourselves to put those leather pants on again for another night. Maybe if we were allowed to tour with cooler opening acts like Iggy Pop or Husker Du, instead of being forced to bring along cheesy pop metal posers like Warrant and Whitesnake, our morale would have been better. Maybe if we had a week off sometimes, a little time in the Bahamas to veg out, we could have made it through the tour sane, but the record label was worried we'd lose our momentum. We were a money machine and they were going to keep working us until we were broke. Until we broke, and dude, break we did. The beginning of the end was a flying drum solo in New Haven, Connecticut. For me, it was always so crucial for people to see what I was doing when I played. In the early Motley days, I tried to use mirrors, but that never really worked. Then before the Girls 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 Tour, I had a crazy-ass dream that I was playing drums in a cage while spitting around and gyroscoping. So we rigged up this ghetto contraption where a forklift would take the drums to the front of the stage and a motor would spin the drums around while I played upside down and shit. At first I would get really dizzy, but then I remembered something I had learned in ballet lessons as a kid and started picking a spot on the wall to stare at while spinning. <clears throat> On the Feel Good Tour, I wanted to get even closer to the bros in the audience, so we rigged up the flying drum set, and it was all good. Until New Haven. To this day, I still don't know what happened. It began like usual. During Mick's solo, I sneaked into this long tube, stuck my feet into a strap hanging there, and wrapped my hand around a rope, which was attached to a chain motor that slowly pulled me up to the top rafters of the New Haven Coliseum. 
I chilled up there for a while, looking 80 feet down to scope out Mick Solo and the audience, who couldn't see me yet. Then with a rigger named Norman holding on to me, I leaped into the air, grabbed the drums, and kicked my body around into the seat. Below, Mick shot some crazy shit out of his guitar. His stacks rumbled like they were about to explode. And then the drums appeared. Whoosh! Over the heads of the audience in the midst of all this really dramatic music. As the audience went out of their minds, I started hitting all these electronic pads. Blow! Blam! Blam! Blow! as the drums shot down toward them on a hundred or so feet of invisible track. I cruised over the heads of the people on the floor, then shot to the very back of the place, so that the dudes in the full-on Stevie Wonder section all of a sudden had front row seats. There was one dude in a jean jacket who I swear to God shit in his pants when all of a sudden I was inches away from his face playing drums in the air. Then I spun around and the whole track adjusted so I could get back to the top of the arena. I triggered a sample of a long descending sound, like someone jumping off a bridge. Ah! Then put my foot back in the strap, grabbed the rope that originally carried me up, and prepared to jump. It was Norman's job to pull the handbrake at the last minute, so that I would screech to a halt like five feet over the heads of the crowd and then just bounce there on this elastic rope. I liked for it to look insane. None of this fucking Gene Simmons fly me over the fucking audience like Peter Pan shit. I wanted to be fully dropped, free fall style. So I sprung off the rafter. Ah! The air whipped past my face. Whoosh! And then I prepared myself mentally for Norman to pull the brake. But as I neared the ground, for some reason I inexplicably lost my trust in him. I didn't think he was going to stop me in time, so I panicked and tried to bail out. I let go of the rope and tried to get my foot out of the strap. I think the sheer exhaustion of so many back-to-back shows had dulled my senses. As soon as Norman saw me struggling to get loose, he hit the brake. Instantly my foot, which was still in the strap, fucking stopped mid-air while the rest of my body continued to fall. I was just a few feet over the audience and... Urgh, my skull fucking smacked against the head of some dude in the audience. And then, because the rope had so much elasticity, I hit the ground head first and blacked out. The next thing I heard was rear, rear. I couldn't remember a thing other than the fact that something had gone wrong. What happened to me? I asked. You just fell, buddy. I did. You fell on your head. Where? At the concert. The concert. I need to be at my concert. I panicked. I was making no sense. I didn't remember having fallen. I just knew that I was supposed to be on stage. Not in a dot, dot, dot. Where am I? You're in an ambulance. We're taking you to the hospital. But the show's over, buddy. Now relax. We ended up canceling a show or two while I recovered from my concussion. Three days later, I found myself facing arena rafters and the elastic rope again. Norman pumped the brakes so that I descended really slowly like some sort of fairy godmother instead of a rock and roll madman, and he stopped me 20 feet above the audience instead of five. It took me a while to get over the fear. The rest of the band was thankful for the extra days off, but afterward it was back to the never-ending road show. As exhaustion and insanity kicked in, our lives started to unravel. First the chicks came marching in. Before the encore, we could mar- we would marinate in a little tent in the back of the stage and suck down cold mineral water. One day we were chilling back there when Nikki pointed out a cat litter box that was mysteriously sitting in the middle of the floor. As we were trying to figure out who was stupid enough to keep a cat backstage, we heard a loud meow. A girl came crawling toward the box on her hands and knees wearing a cat collar and a leash led by a roadie. Vince looked at me for an explanation. I looked at Nikki. Nikki looked at Mick. And Mick looked back at Vince. No one knew what was going on. The girl crawled into the cat box, hiked up her dress, peed in the sand, and then scratched at the litter until she had covered her mess. Soon we were finding ways out of the drudgery by amusing ourselves with stupid human tricks and watching our road crew reach new lows. A whole cat theme began to develop, based around the line, Here, kitty, kitty, from same old situation. The roadies would stand in a circle and jack off into their hands while some poor but willing girl crawled around meowing on all fours and licking it out of their hands like milk. 
Nikki thought it was funny, but then again, Nikki has mother issues. What began as a clean and wholesome tour had, near the end, turned into a sick sexual circus. We were sober and had nothing else to do, so the girls became our only entertainment. Once we started looking at the girls, we noticed that they were going out of their way to get our attention, sporting leather masks with ball gags, nun outfits with holes cut to expose their tits, nurse uniforms with enema bags, skin-tight red devil costumes with dildos for horns, and cowboy outfits with cans of shaving cream in the holsters. The weak among us cracked under the pressure, choosing girls backstage who offered something they hadn't tried before. During the show, we entered the stage by being shot up in front of 25,000 to 100,000 people from a contraption underneath the stage as if we were four giant Pop-Tarts. Those contraptions eventually became a metaphor for the tour. Whenever we wanted to rest or sleep, all of a sudden, someone would pull the lever and pop, there we would be, standing in front of a stadium full of cheering people, ready to see the same song and dance we'd been <clears throat> we'd been through hundreds of times already. For our whole lives, every one of us had fucking fantasized about being exactly where we were on that tour. But after two years, we came to hate and dread our jobs. Nikki liked to compare it to an erection. It feels great for a few minutes, but when it won't go down after hours of be beating off, it starts to hurt like no other pain known to man. So we killed the pain like we always had. In Australia, Vince slipped off the wagon. After they scraped us off the floor in Australia and poured us into Japan, Nikki stumbled. And when they dragged us to Hawaii, I went to a strip club with Vince and fell victim to a big tittied waitress with a tray of Dayglow alcohol shooters and test tubes. Soon, with our relationships at home suffering from neglect, we were all sneaking alcohol, buying drugs, and reverting to our old self-destructive habits, with the possible exception of Mick, whose fiancé happened to be on the road with us as a backup singer. Near the end of the tour, Electra sent over a film crew. They were having a massive sales conference with the buyers for all the record chains, and they thought it'd be a good idea for us to tape a message sucking up to the retailers and thanking them for their support. So we gathered backstage in front of the crew, they started the cameras, and we behaved like good puppets. Hey guys, we're Motley Crew, and we'd like to thank you for making our record number one. But then, suddenly, the puppet strings snapped. And we want to let you know that we hate you, and we hate Electra. You guys aren't giving us a break. You're all a bunch of greedy fucking assholes, and we know where you live, and we're going to come slit your throats if you don't let us see our families. When the camera was shut off, we fucking collapsed on the floor and full on sobbed. We couldn't even speak. We were so exhausted, so depleted, so devoid of all thought and emotion. Doug Thaler looked at us, shook his head, and said, Maybe it's time we took you guys off the road for a little while. Dude, you've never seen four motherfuckers split up and go their own ways faster than we did. <laughs> 